Jesus' name, amen. Please turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 23.1. We finished last week with uh, God's command on the importance of virginity and and, uh, sexual fidelity in marriage. And I, I wanted to again this week, just for our YouTube audience, to just say that um, and we, we're gonna, I'm going to put on the screen right now in the, in the YouTube this. And I, is it up there still? Huh? It's not. Okay, but we're... Um, so the, the icon that's on our homepage uh, for Rumble. So if you can't get us on YouTube, you can get us on Rumble. And there's a Rumble icon next to the YouTube icon on the homepage that you'll see on your screen. Uh, when it gets edited on to the screen during the editing process. And uh, because YouTube might be someday getting rid of us on the YouTube channel, and then that's how you'll be able to get us uh, in the future by going to calvarypo.org, which is our website, and then click on the rumble icon. So this week, the title of this study is Laws to Prevent Destruction from Within. So God, again, is laying out in the law Uh, the law of Moses referred to, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, some of these laws are to keep his chosen people, the Jews, alive through the centuries and millennia, actually, until all of history is going to be accomplished as he planned. And are the Jews around today? Yeah, they are. Miraculously, because, and they've had to be severely disciplined because of the times they rejected God's law. But as we're going to see today, when we look at these laws, if these laws are followed, all the ones that God gave to his Jewish people, they would have never struggled. They wouldn't have had to been disciplined and twice kicked out of the nation of Israel, twice kicked out of Jerusalem and having Jerusalem destroyed. Wouldn't have had to have it happen if they would have obeyed the laws. But because they disobeyed the laws, they, they became like the nations around them. They were no longer the witness people, and God had to destroy them. And so we have to realize whenever we're reading the Bible that we're reading it with that context. God chose Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. You're my witness people. And so you're going to be that light on a hill. You're the lighthouse in the harbor for people to come to a knowledge of me and my salvation plan. And if, you, if the light goes out, I'm going to have to mess with you <laughs> to get the light back on. Because the lighthouse without the light... Is, is no good to anybody that's you know, running into the rocks on the pier, uh, on, the, on the harbor. And so uh, we have to understand that's what the Bible is really about. That's the background of it. Now we're going to read verses 1 through 8 and then go verse by verse uh, through those to get a better understanding. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation, talking about uh, castrated or mutilated, as is happening in our culture now all around the world, um, by people wanting to be, uh, which is beyond comprehension to me. That's what it's talking about here. Shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. They shall not be allowed to come into the Jewish nation. They're not allowed to be Jews in the nation of Israel. One of illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite, descendants of Lot, living in Jordan today, north and central Jordan today, shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, uh, for he is your brother. Edomites came from Esau, who was the brother of Jacob. We'll, We'll get to that more. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So once again, some of these verses are used to mock the Bible by people that don't understand the history of the Bible, the purpose of the Bible, the purpose for these laws to the Jewish nation, and we'll look at that. 
And uh, by the way, I was, I was said to a couple of people this last week that I thought had heard it before, but do you know what the Bible stands for? What be it? Bible stands for an acronym meaning Bible, so I'm going to make it so none of you can say you didn't know it already. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Okay, now how many had never heard that? Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, it was surprising, a guy I've known forever, and he goes, Kevin, I haven't ever heard that. Where have you been? <laughs> so basic instructions before leaving earth. And, and, the, and the basic instructions applied to the Jews during the dispensation of the Jews. And now these instructions, we're going to see how they also apply to the church. They apply to the church age, as we're going to see very clearly here. Now, consider all of the above were to prevent the Jewish people from being destroyed from within. It, it really, we're going to get to the, the emphasis of it, but don't open your borders to people that want to kill you. Don't open your borders to people that hate you. Don't open your borders to people that have different gods that they worship because they'll bring in their gods into your nation. Is that a problem in our culture today? Okay, so have we opened up our borders to people that want to kill us, that have a completely different mindset? Their culture is different, their religion is different. And what, what do we know will happen to America as it was founded? upon the principles of the Judeo-Christian faith. What happens to that if you allow your borders to open up and welcome these people in that hate that Judeo-Christian ethic? It'll be destroyed. And see, God was telling them, don't do it. I know what will happen if you do. You'll be destroyed. And see, what we're doing, what, what the elites are doing, is doing it on purpose. Why? Because they want America destroyed. You have to understand, how can they be so stupid? Can't they see what's happening? Can't they see how? Um, yeah, they do understand. <laughs> and, and why are they wanting to do it? Because the Bible tells us the ultimate, the ultimate condition of the world in the last days, which we're heading to every day for the last thousands of years, we're heading to the last days. The Bible tells us what the last days are going to be. Instead of 194 nations, as there are now about, there's going to be 10. There's going to be a 10-nation global empire ruled by an antichrist who's going to be over the whole thing. And the world elites are openly advocating for that to make it happen soon. And this isn't conspiracy. This is their own words. But see, the tragedy today is you're censored to even use their own words to try and tell people what's going on, even though they say. Uh, you know, there was a, one of the websites, a popular website news guy was censored for saying the very thing the elites are saying. Because they don't really want it to be totally out, even though they're, they're saying it's too late for anybody to do anything about it. We've got it covered. It's going to happen. You can try and stop it if you want, but we're too far down the track. So they're deliberately destroying America because America and all nations have to go down. There has to be universal misery across the world in order for people to embrace something they don't want to embrace, which is a global government to deliver them from the chaos that will be ensuing when everything goes down. And as soon as you understand that, you realize they're not dumb. They're smart for what they want to do. And they're making this happen. And, and it'll keep your, and you know what it does? It gives me a peace. Because Jesus says that this is going to be the last of last days, what they do. So then they're doing it, so it must be the last, last day. And he's told me that this is not my world. That he has, see, we're going to go to a global government too. It's ruled by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever and ever. It's a universal <laughs> government. It's, a, it's eternity with a God that we want to serve, and, and that's coming soon. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, going back to verse 1. Uh, it says in verse 1, He who is emasculated, castrated, by crushing or mutilation, which would be complete mutilation, removal of genitalia, shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. And let's turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 26, because there's an amazing little, um, otherwise easy to pass over miracle of the, of the authorship of the Bible associated with this and really, let's think about this. Okay, Kevin, you said that all these laws have to do with the, with the strength of the nation of Israel and its preservation. How does this affect that? How does this law affect that? Well, 
because the nations of the people that were around them, they were probably a lot like ours because we know there was full of sexual immorality. And they know that the stepping stone is you turn away from the laws of God, then you believe a lie of Satan. You're not actually a guy, you're, you're, you're a woman. And the woman, you're not really a woman, you're a guy. Uh, goes into, which is a lie. Or to act, to act like not the normal way of a relationship between a man and a woman, but a perverse way. Satan inspires people to do that because it's a lie. And see, and the Bible says when, in 2 Thessalonians, it says when people turn away from the truth, then, they, then God gives them over to a lie because if you turn away from the truth, you're turning away from God. When you turn away from God, you turn to the author of lies, who is Satan. And Satan deceives people and says, you're not a guy, you're a woman. You're not a woman, you're a guy. You're not gonna have a relationship this way, that way. And the cultures do that. And then, and then as we're observing, see, the, if I would have been saying this 30 years ago, you would be thinking, not, in a, not ever. The 16-year-olds are showing up to doctors who are willing to give them a hysterectomy because they don't think that they're a woman and they want to get as close to being a man as they can. And that's being allowed to happen in this country. And states are trying to write laws to prevent that from ever happening, to call it, to call it what it is, which is child abuse. And then they have people that are boycotting their state for doing things like this. And so you think, how could this happen? Well, because people are turning to Satan, to his lies. They're being deceived. They're embracing a deception that is destroying their lives. And so there, would have, there could have been people like that in the cultures around them, very possibly. Um, although it was also done, if, if you are a king and you have an harem, harem of women um, that are your wives and concubines and you want to have some male guys around to help with things, you want to castrate them by force so that you know that they're not going to be a problem with the women that are there. And that was very common. And in fact, we know that Daniel, the prophet Daniel, was taken by Nebuchadnezzar to be a wise man and put, in, in, put into his wise man. He goes, I don't want you to be bothered by anything, any of the women around here and everything. So they all got, he castrated uh, Daniel and the other Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all the ones that he took, castrated him. So... That was normally what happened, but let's go to Acts, because there was a eunuch. A eunuch is a castrated man from Ethiopia, and actually the Ethiopia is, in the ancient use of, of the word, was also South Sudan, the area of Sudan, <laughs> where we've been to. And he, was, uh, he worked for the queen of Ethiopia, and, but he loves God. Now, I would imagine that he knew about this law. And we'll, we'll follow that thread. So we're fast forwarding 1,500 years from the verse that we read in chapter 23, verse 1 of Deuteronomy. 1,500 years to Jesus is, has died, resurrected, ascended into heaven. The church is birthed on Pentecost. And now the disciples are witnessing to everybody that they can find because Jesus told them to. Go into the uttermost parts of the world bringing this gospel. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, an evangelist at the time saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down to, from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Can you imagine that? You know, you're just, wow, Jesus has ascended into heaven. He gave us the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And, and now this angel says, go to Gaza. You know, Gaza today. It's in the news today. Go to Gaza down the desert area. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia a eunuch, castrated man, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. So he, he was a, an esteemed servant to the point where she entrusted this man with the treasury of the nation and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now again, I'm gonna assume he knows about Deuteronomy because we're gonna see why in a minute. And, uh, but he came to Jerusalem to worship. Now, why would an Ethiopian, a foreign nation, want to come to Jerusalem to worship? How do they even know about the God of Israel? Well, um, extra biblical history to a certain extent, when Solomon was king of Israel, um, who was it that came to visit him? Queen of, queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba is queen of Ethiopia. And she came and she marveled at 
um, the wonders of Solomon's wisdom and wealth and took that back to Ethiopia and extra biblical history, and the Jews believe that this is true, is that she and Solomon had a relationship, a son by that, and when Solomon started going south and the kings after that, and they saw that the Babylonians were going to come, that the, one of the arks, you know, that an ark or a copy of the ark was actually transported to Ethiopia to keep um, some of the Jewish heritage alive down there when the corruption was happening in Israel. And did you know today there is a group of Ethiopians that guard over a building that supposedly the Ark of the Covenant's in there. And so there, there's great history from the times of Solomon to Judaism being taught and understood in Ethiopia. And the greatest airlift rescue of Ethiopian Jews happened just not too many decades ago, a couple decades ago, out of Ethiopia to bring Jews from the time of Solomon. And also a strong Christian influence as a result of the gospel of Jesus going back to Ethiopia because of this guy. And uh, so, came to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So now, um, he didn't just go down to the bookstore and buy a Bible. Do you realize he bought a scroll of Isaiah? Do you think that was expensive? Yes. Hand done, scrolled by the, the scribes of Israel. So he paid big bucks to buy a scroll of Isaiah. He's in his chariot going back home. He's reading Isaiah. Then the spirit of said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip goes, okay, I'm in Gaza. Angel told me to get to Gaza. Gaza, I'm, I'm in Gaza. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to him a word of knowledge and says, that chariot right there. Now, why would, that, why would the Holy Spirit say, go to that chariot? Because God looks at the heart of everybody that's seeking him, you know? Can you remember before you got saved? And I'm assuming everybody's saved here. And if you're not, well, by the, ch by the fact that you're here, if you weren't forced to be here, um, then you're seeking God. And it's good to seek God. Because you know what God says? God says, if you seek him, you'll find him when you seek him with your whole heart. And so there's probably a lot of chariots leaving Jerusalem that day. But Philip goes to the one, goes to one to a, a foreigner who's seeking so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Heard him reading it out loud. And said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, what would have happened by a, just a regular Jew? He's not allowed to sit up in a chariot with a foreigner. But see, now Christianity has come. Christianity has come, and nobody is a Gentile. Nobody is unclean. Everybody gets to hear about Jesus. And is the Bible hard to understand? It is hard to understand. And I, even when I came to Jesus, I go, I want to understand this so much. I want to understand. I was so like, man, there's so many questions I had. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 10, Paul says that how can somebody hear unless somebody's sent? And how can, how can they, you know, they've got to be sent and there's got to be people that have to explain things to people because they're being lied to by Satan and by the world system all day long. And they're being told that this is a bunch of lies and they shouldn't even believe it. And it's too archaic and it's only written by man. And, and they don't understand that's a lie from Satan and they need to come to a knowledge. And so the whole purpose of the church is for you to know the truth about the word of God so that you can be like, you can be like Philip and be that person that jumps in to somebody's um, electric car. <laughs> so, because that's all they're gonna be here in a few more years, um, jump into their chariot. So, that's why, we, that's why it's so important to study the Bible. God wants to use you as a Philip, filled with the Holy Spirit that can listen to the Holy Spirit, say, hey, you know, go, go someplace and tell that person, and then for you to respond. Because what if Philip would have said, I'm not going to go to the desert. It's too far away. Or I'm not going to jump up in that chariot. I'm not going to go to that chariot. This doesn't happen. And, and see, the same thing for us. Either we're not equipped, or we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, or we're not willing and something can suffer as a result of that. 
the place in the scripture, he said, so came and sat with him. Uh, the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before it shears his silence, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Now, where does that come from? Isaiah 53. Because I put it in your notes or because you knew? <laughs> uh, the famous section of scripture, if you take somebody that doesn't know the Bible and says, oh, it was just written by man or whatever else, and say, why don't you read Isaiah 53? Tell me who you think it's talking about. And they would say, oh, Isaiah 53, that's talking about Jesus. That's one of the Gospels, right? Uh, no, it was written 700 years before Jesus came. Why? I mean, it perfectly describes the ministry of Jesus. That he was beaten, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted on our behalf. That by, by him taking our iniquities upon himself, he was going to make many righteous. That's the mission of Jesus. 700 years before he comes, because it was prophetic. And so this Ethiopian is reading this, and he's confused as to what it means. Verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? You know, I don't understand. Is, is Isaiah writing this about himself? How is he not opening his mouth? How is he? He's talking about somebody that that is, suffers on other people's behalf and makes people righteous. Is, is that him or is it somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this, script, at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. You know what? Jesus is all over the Old Testament. You don't have to, you know, what, what was Paul preaching when he was going around evangelizing the world at the time? He was preaching the scriptures out of the Old Testament. All the prophecies about Jesus and how it was fulfilled in this Jesus, God, man, son of God, son of man that came and fulfilled the scriptures pertaining uh, to the prophetic word, which is uh, Isaiah 53. So let's turn to Isaiah 56, but keep your finger, keep your finger in Acts chapter 8. We're going to come back. So Isaiah 53. Now I'm going to conjecture here and say beginning at Isaiah 53, Philip preached Jesus to him as he went through the scripture. I'm going to assume he got to 56 at least. And we're going to read something in 56 that would have blown the Ethiopian away. Thus says the Lord, Isaiah 56 verse 1, Keep justice and do righteousness. For my salvation, and this is a prophecy about Jesus, it's talking about Jesus, my salvation, which is Jesus, is about to come, first time. And my righteousness, imputed righteousness to those who believe, to be revealed. Was it revealed in Jesus that the righteousness of God would be imputed to us because of what he did for us on the cross? Verse 2, blessed is the man, even an Ethiopian eunuch, who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil, do not let the son of a foreigner, and I'm going to put in here in, in light of our Deuteronomy study, a Moabite or an Ammonite, because this is for them too. But don't, do not let the son of a foreigner, a Moabite, Ammonite, or others that were told, don't ever let him into the kingdom, 10th generation, don't let him into Israel, who has joined himself to the Lord, wants to become a Jew in, in, in heart, to join himself to the Lord speaks, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. Now, now think about that. God is saying right here in Isaiah 56, there's going to be a new dispensation that's going to do away with Deuteronomy. It's going to be a dispensation where the church is inviting everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a Moabite, an Ammonite, an Edomite, or whatever you are, a homosexual, uh, an adulterer, a fornicator, whatever else. It's, if you're willing to say, God, I want your law. I want to repent of my rebellion against you. I want to stop living my life for the world's system and the world's lust. I want you to govern my life. 
and I want to, and the, the Sabbath emphasis. What do we, when we become a Christian, what do we enter into? We enter into, according to Hebrews, God's rest. We're not working for anything. We, we are admitting to God, I can't work for salvation. I can't go to heaven because I'm dirty and I need you to clean me. And we, and we just rest in Jesus washing us. You know, when, when uh, in swimming, we're trying, I had to learn at times how to rescue people in swimming. And, and you know what you have to do? If they won't rest, you know, calm down, calm down. Why? Because they, they're so freak, they just don't want to be rescued. And so you either have to put them to rest <laughs> by smacking them, because they'll, uh, and, but, it, but what happens is if they just trust you, that you're, that you're saving them, they just rest. And then you're saving them. And that's what God wants us to do. He just stop fighting me. Stop thinking that I'm gonna, here to drown you. Stop, just, just rest. And let me, you enter into my rest, I can give you life. And so the eunuch, was, according to Deuteronomy 23.1, the eunuch could never be part of the kingdom of Israel. But he can become a kingdom of Jesus. He can be, in, he can be embraced by God through the new covenant of everlasting life. Because the, the issue isn't so longer so much keeping the nation of Israel alive till the Messiah comes, because now the Messiah is here. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, the new covenant, even, which is in Jeremiah 31, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Do you think the Ethiopian was pretty excited about that? Not in your notes, but John 14. <sighs> Don't know, but if Philip would have known his Bible, <laughs> if he would have known the teaching of Jesus, he would have said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. This is Jesus speaking. And my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There where I am, there you will be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. See, Jesus promised that in Isaiah, 700 years before he came, to an Ethiopian eunuch that didn't exist yet. Um, <laughs> somebody was telling me that their, their husband, who rejects the Bible, rejects Christianity because he pointed, to, he pointed to her reading the Bible and said, because that is written by man. Really? So how do you explain <laughs> All the prophecies. And how do you explain the way God communicates uh, so amazingly to us of his love? So back to eight, Acts 8.34. So then, again, I am conjecturing that they went to 56, verse 1 of Isaiah, and he would have been seeing God writing to him in this case. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Which means fully, fully immersed. See, the baptism of the temple days going to the temple was you're fully immersed into the idea that you're going to go up on the temple and sacrifice a bull of goat. That, that was the Jewish mikvah baptism. Well, now people are being taught since the day of Pentecost, being baptized into Jesus. You're being fully immersed in the fact, I don't have to sacrifice a bull and goat. God sacrificed his son, Jesus, and I want to believe in him and have everlasting life and a relationship with him apart from the, law, the sacrificial law system because now all of that's fulfilled in Jesus. And he goes, what hinders me from being born again? 
Then Philip said, if you believe in all, with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus, which is God's salvation, which is what God said in Isaiah 56, I'm going to bring salvation. So G Jesus, Yeshua, means God's salvation. Christ means the anointed one promised by God to be sent into the world is the Son of God because God's Son means that he is able to save us from sin because he's God himself. And that's what we have to believe, that I am lost, I need a Savior. Jesus is the only one who can do it because he means God's salvation. He's the only one that's God's salvation. And he is the anointed one that God promised in the Old Testament prophecies. And I believe he is God himself. That's why people who don't believe Jesus is God are not saved. Because Philip said, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, too. I mean, it's implied by what he then goes on to confess. If you don't believe Jesus is God, then you're still lost, because then Jesus is just a man, and a man can't save, a sinful man can't save a sinful man. Only the God-man, Jesus, who lived a perfect life and was never, never sinned, can save us. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, verse 38, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, you know, implying fully immersed, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. You know what the word is there for caught him away? Rapture, you know, harpazo. The Greek word harpazo, which is where we get rapture from the Latin version, which is he was, he was literally raptured. He was taken by God away from the Ethiopian eunuch like we're gonna be taken away someday, hopefully soon. So that the eunuch saw him no more, <laughs> he came up out of the water and Philip is like, gone. Can you imagine what that would have done? And, and he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, tradition has it that this Ethiopian went to Ethiopia and he told Candace and everybody else, Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament scripture, became a believer, and lit off the church in Ethiopia, which has a strong heritage of Christianity. In fact, when I was in Texas, I was praying because, you know, I don't have a smartphone to get an Uber. And I, so I just asked the people at the, at the um, hotel that I was staying at, the old-fashioned way, a taxi. I didn't even know if they had taxis still, <laughs> regular ones that you could just call up. And, and so there was this guy, and I said, Lord, I just want to see your hand in this, too. I want to see your hand in, in this, you know, just providing. So the first number, nobody answers. Second number, I'll be there in 10 minutes. An Ethiopian Christian <laughs> who, who had come for 20 years, been in the country, and he goes, what is it with you Americans? Your country is being destroyed since I've seen it. Since I've come here, I've watched you abandon the heritage. I've learned a little bit about your country and about your heritage in Jesus, and look at what has happened to you. And he goes, and not only that, your country comes to my country and says that our, our financial aid is going to be cut off if we don't embrace the homosexual lifestyle in our country. So that was a God thing, don't you think? <laughs> to meet this guy and, you know, still have his phone number and probably catch up with him again sometime. So go back to Deuteronomy 23.1. So he who is emasculated but crushing mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Now, let's look at it that, you know, why would that be a preservation? Because an emasculated person cannot have children. He, the way the Jewish system was set up, is it's the, for the 12 tribes of Israel. Somebody could come from another nation like Uriah the Hittite, and he could help out in the army. But if you've been castrated, you're not gonna be much good in the army. You're not gonna be able to handle a sword and a spear and a shield like the men are gonna have to because it, being castrated wimp, wimps you out. You lose your hormones and you're no good there. You can't have children. You can't really, you know, it, it becomes difficult and to protect from people that had come out of the pagan lifestyles that were around that were emasculated for that reason. One of Ill illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Why? Well, based on our study last week, what does it take to have an 
illegitimate child in Israel. Uh, it, it takes complete rebellion against the law of God. And so really, and really if it's illegitimate, it's probably a man from another nation. Because if it was a man within the nation of Israel, it would be dealt with, that guy's gonna die, and there's gonna, be, there's gonna be judgment associated with that. But if a woman in the nation of Israel has somebody that's from another country around the nation of Israel, which hates Israel, then her child being allowed to grow up, and we all know this, people adopt children, right? What happens when that child finds out who their real parents are? There's an automatic, there's an automatic kind of affection towards the original parents, the bio parents, that can be very frustrating to an adoptive family. And so what happens if, oh, your dad's a Moabite and he hated the nation of Israel, even though he thinks he's a Jew, he grew up in, the, in, in a family of Jews because he was illegitimate, he's gonna be an enemy to the nation of Israel. He's a potential, he's a potential treasonous person, which is why our own constitution, taking from the Bible, says that somebody has to be from America to be a president of the country. Because if they're from someplace else, they have attachments to some other country in their birth, then they're gonna be possibly treasonous and you just wanna keep them out, so that's why. In Deuteronomy 23.3, an Ammonite or a Moabite, which again, are descendants of Lot. Lot was a nephew of Abraham, and he's, you know, the whole story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, a, a, a whole city where every single male came to rape the angels that were warning Lot to get out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were gonna rape the angels that looked like men. And so they, the angels blinded the men. Lot and his wife and two daughters escape. The wife turns around, this is in the book of Genesis. The wife turns around because she's missing the party back for that night and you know, whatever. She was told not to turn around. She looked behind, she got turned to a pillar of salt. And then now Lot and his two daughters are up on the hill. Um, he gets drunk, I mean, they're out of the city. They watch the burning of the city. The daughters think all life is gone on earth and they think they have to have relationships with, with uh, Lot uh, to keep population growing. And so in an incestuous relationship with Lot led to the Ammonites and the Moabites, and they hated Israel their whole time, their whole history. Don't let people that hate Israel into the nation of Israel. And, and they tried to, they hired a sorcerer, Balaam, to try and destroy him, and Balaam, by his advice, almost destroyed the nation of Israel. So don't let people that hate us in. And as I said earlier, man, are we messing up on that. And, and that's why, you know, you've heard me say it, well, how can we have hope in an election? How can we have hope in a man when millions and millions of people are pouring into this country by design to destroy this place? It's like we're outnumbered in this war and they're doing it with impunity because all the intelligence agencies are behind the globalist agenda. The, the executive branch is behind the globalist agenda and they're letting us just, you know, what are we supposed to do? Just leave us asleep, go watch your football and baseball and listen to the national news that we program you with propaganda and just stay asleep until you're dead. That's, that's where we're headed. Only we're not gonna die, right? Because we have everlasting life in Jesus because we have, the, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. I am so glad we're going home. So there are exceptions to the Moabites, Ammonites, any, any notable ones? Ruth. Ruth the Moabitress, allowed to come in, why? <laughs> why, because she wanted to worship the God of Israel. Or is there infiltration in the church? Oh, you know, that's fine for America to open its borders. The church would never open its borders, would it? How about Revelation 2.14, God's message to the, to the seven churches of Asia and the, and the church, the compromising church, Pergamos. And this is what he says in Revelation 2.14. I know it's not your notes, but I have a few things against you because you have there within your church those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
<laughs> the Moabite. I mean, they're, the doctrine of let sexual immorality get down into the nation of Israel and God will destroy them. And so there were pastors that were bringing doctrines of Balaam, sexual immorality being allowed in the church, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. That's not happening in the church, is it? I mean, look, look around. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I, I see news items of transvestite pastors that they are up in the pulpit and ha having, you know, drag queen hours and stuff for the kids in the church to read drag queen stories. And, and I say this again to just look at the deception that's come. Look at, look at what has happened because we've turned away from the word of God. And all this disaster is happening and it makes us realize deception of Satan is swept into this country. And we can't let it sweep into the church. You know, we can't do anything about <laughs> what's out there, but we can do here, right? Is everybody here committed, spiritually speaking? God, I don't want to be involved in sexual immorality. Can we all yeah. amen to that? We, we don't want to. If you have done it, are, can we all say, God, forgive me for being involved in sexual immorality. I know it's for the deception of Satan to destroy my life and to destroy my witness. And, and today I am committing to you by the power of your spirit that you'll set me free from sexual immorality. Can we do that? Amen. Because we don't want to be infiltrated. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You know what? Sodom and Gomorrah were happening cities. They know archaeologically they were rich trading partners with the rest of the world. Because Satan, Satan will cause wealth to pour into vice, to immorality, and to stuff. There can be great wealth. And what, what God is saying, don't seek that. Don't seek the earthly wealth. Don't seek the earthly pamperings of the flesh. Seek God, because they are going to be destroyed. But you've got to seek God. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. And you've got to read Genesis 25 and following. Um, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn, but Esau sold his birthright to his brother, Jacob. And, but it's, God says, but it's still your brother. <laughs> so, so don't abhor an Edomite even though the Edomites wanted to kill the Jews throughout all the history. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation bore them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So the Egyptians didn't really, historically, they didn't want to wipe out the Jews. In fact, for times of their history, Israel was, depend instead of depending upon God to defend them against the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they depended upon Egypt, their buddy. And, and God had to warn him through the prophets, why are you trusting in Egypt? You used to trust me, God saying. You used to trust me, you trust Egypt. You want to run to Egypt after the Babylonians came. You want to run to Egypt. Don't run to Egypt. Run to me, let me rule. And pff, people want to always run to man. What do we run to when things get tough? We run to God. And Deuteronomy 23.9, when the army goes out against your enemies then keep yourself from every wicked thing. Now, what is he really emphasizing, wicked thing? Think about this, because just after this is written, they're going to go into Jericho. What happens in Jericho? One of the families in Jericho, one of the warriors, go, when you go out to battle, keep yourself from every wicked thing. What did he do? He took idols from one of the tents of the people in Jericho, hid it in his tent to keep his own little idol. And don't do that. When you go to war and you're having to go into these cities, stay away from the idols. Don't, don't stick their Playboy magazines and penthouses in your, in your luggage. Don't do anything else. Just stay away from the sexual immorality and the things of the world. Are we in war today? Every time you walk out your door, what are you doing? You're, you're going to war. You're, you're in a spiritual battle of what are you going to do? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places that want to destroy us. And we got to wake up and go, God, go into war today. Don't let any wicked thing be picked up of this corrupt world into my life that, I would, that would destroy my witness. If there is any man among you who becomes unclean or by some occurrence in the night, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp, but it shall be when evening comes, that he shall wash with water 
and when the sun sets, he may come back into the camp. Now, this is a discharge of bodily fluid. He could, have, he could have had diarrhea. He could have thrown up. He could have had wet dreams. He could have had some other biological hazard going on. And it's basically the, the laws of being unclean are, hey, you could, God was saying, bacteria is a real thing. Now, if you, if in the night you throw up, and what do you do? Go into the bathroom, take a shower, put the laundry into, you know, put the, clothes, the sheets into the laundry and wash up and everything's okay. Ah, not so easy when you're out on the battlefront, <laughs> when you're out in battle and out where, you know, what are you going to do? And so he, God was using this law, knowing about diseases, say, this, this can hurt you, so go out, go get clean before you come back, you're sick, something happens, you can't get, as soon as you stop throwing up, having diarrhea, then you can come back in because you're sick. Isn't that wise for God to do that, to keep the nation strong? You also shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out and you may have an implement among your equipment and when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Is that, is that a good wisdom there? You know, agenda one, today when you go camping, what's the first thing you want to do? <laughs> you want to go make your little outhouse someplace if you're going to be there for a while. Why? Because you know we've got to keep things, we've got to keep away from the bacteria associated with where, you know, the latrine. And at the time, God's saying, you're different. I know what, what happens if you guys don't clean up. You'll have diseases spread through your camp. Wise. You shall not give back to his master, the slave, who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst in the place which he chooses within one of your gates, where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. So... It's, it's talking about, so who, who's a slave in Israel? Well, Jews can have other Jews be their slaves. But what does the Bible say about that? It, it's only because of financial issues. Somebody needs some money and says, hey, you know, my son or my daughter, I'm going to sell them to slavery because, you know, I broke, you know, I broke my leg and I can't do anything. I need some money for the crop this year or whatever else. And so that person becomes a Jewish slave to that person for seven years, and on the seventh year, they have to be let loose, have to be let loose. But the other way that people, slavery happened in Israel is not because Israel went to another country and forced people onto slave ships and forced them to come into Israel. Never happened. The, the Western form of slavery is completely unbiblical. And what happened during the Civil War, the arguments given by the people of the South that were slave owners and stuff, they used, oh, we own the slave. Look at here what it says in the Bible, you own a slave. It was completely different then than it is in the Bible. The, the Bible was internal with Israel, financial slavery like me joining the Navy for eight and a half years. I could have said, I don't want to be a slave anymore, and they said, tough luck. You're going to keep your, you're going to keep your commitment here. And it was financial, so I could eat better. <laughs> and, but... Then for foreigners coming in, it's like, I want to worship your God. I want to turn away from my idolatrous master, my idolatrous country. I am running away from my people forever. And I am embracing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to serve you as a people, as God's people, and serve the laws of your people. I want to serve God. And so then the Jews go, okay, I'll, I'll keep you as a slave. Even marry a Jewish girl if it's a guy and ultimately become part of the nation of Israel. And if the Moabite or Ammonite or Edomite or whatever it is, master comes and says, my slave ran away to here and I'm going to come back and beat him because he stopped worshiping my idols and I beat him to a pulp, you don't give him back to him. You just say, sorry, he's under new management. Now, do you think that when you became a child of God that Satan was all done trying to get you back to be his slave again? But see, God isn't going to give you back to his slave. You become a true child of God. He's coming to try and get you. Satan is trying to come and get you. 
And you know, for me, some, some people, it's like, you know, maybe I shouldn't serve God and they want to go serve Satan again. And that just it blows me away. It just grieves me. And I've seen it happen. But you know what? It's only going to be because you say, I want to go back. Because if you want to stay in the nation of Israel, you want to stay a believer in Jesus, Jesus tells Satan, get out. He belongs to me. Yeah. So... Um, and, and actually, we'll close with 1 Kings 8.41. 1 Kings 8.41. This is Solomon dedicating the temple. And uh, that, you know, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, the first permanent temple there in Jerusalem. And he says in 1 Kings 8.41, Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake. For they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm when Israel is being the lighthouse. Which was, you know, ding, during King David, a little bit of King Solomon till King Solomon started worshiping idols. When he comes to pray towards this temple here in heaven and your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you. God, I want you to be my God. I want to be a Jew. I want to live here. I want you to take my life. Then all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel. And they may, that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. And so... How awesome it is that, well, Jesus said, if, you, the, if the son will make you free, <laughs> and the scribes and Pharisees said, we've never been a slave. What do you mean you're going to make us free? While they're under slavery of Rome. I mean, it just shows you how crazy they were. And so Jesus says that, the Son will make you free because we're a slave of Satan. If we're not a, if we're not a believer in Jesus Christ, then we're, if we're a believer, then we're free. If we're not a believer, we're a slave. And we're a slave of Satan. And God at the cross, by shedding his blood, as he said, he destroyed. He fulfilled the prophecy of Genesis 3. He crushed Satan's head. He destroyed the power of Satan to own us because we are owned by him until we get set free by belief and trust in Jesus as our savior. And once we're his, we're his. We'll still mess up, we'll still sin, but our hearts been changed. God, I want to serve you. And devil, you know, get away from me, Satan. You don't own me anymore. I can now serve God. I can have a clean conscience I can be forgiven, and I'm going to serve Jesus until I drop. And I, your, your lusts and pleasures don't appeal to me anymore, or I don't want them to appeal to me anymore. I want to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what Jesus says for you. And even this law, don't, don't send people back to the devil. <laughs> the last story along with that, I, I got saved in a Billy Graham Evangelical Association movie. You know, they made a movie, The Gospel, and I, and I believed. I, I went forward in that movie from a total pagan to a believer, went forward, I told this story before, and I got saved. I'm so thankful for that. So are we. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but then I found out as I grew older in my walk that at, if you go to an actual crusade, Mr. Graham, Billy Graham, made a deal with the Catholics that if somebody comes forward and they're Catholic, I'll send them to your priest. And, and, and when I'm reading this section of scripture, I'm thinking, how could you do that? Because the Catholic doctrine is not the doctrine that saves. It is, and I want to warn you if you're Catholic here, I'm just, I mean lovingly telling you that you're putting in a hope in something that is not the truth. Because you don't even have a hope. I mean, the Pope says you can't know if you're going to heaven. The Bible says you can know you're going to heaven. Because a Catholic is taught you've got to have the seven sacraments of the church. And, and you've got to appeal to Mary, which is, which is 
in rebellion against God because God says don't talk to the dead. And, and by the way, Mary was not born perfect because she said that she worshiped Jesus and, as her savior. So she knew she was a sinner in need of a savior. So she said that. And the Pope can't omni-domini anything. Jesus' blood shed on the cross cleanses me from all sin when I believe. So to me, I look at it to say, oh, you want to come forward and have everlasting... You're a Catholic, so obviously you're not satisfied with what, what your relationship with God is, and you want to come forward and believe in Jesus? Well, we'll send you back to the people that are going to keep you in darkness. And that, that too, is complete rebellion to this section of Deuteronomy. You're, you're sending a, a person in slavery to a false gospel back into that slavery. And, uh, and, and t- I was so bothered by it, I wrote Billy Graham Association saying... I can't believe you're, I heard you're doing this and I know from certain people that it did happen. Are you going to turn away from that doctor for the reasons I just said? No, nope, not going to turn away. So, because yeah. compromise, the compromising church. We're not going to compromise the truth is the truth, right? We, we, it, this is life and death. This is more important than anything human life and death. This is eternal life and death. That's what all of you are an ambassador for. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're an ambassador for this truth that has to go out into this world while there's still time. Father, we thank you for this, for this time and your word. And God, we do stand in awe at your word and how you inspired the prophets to write things hundreds of years before they were being fulfilled in ways that are just so miraculous and could not have been possibly engineered by men over 1,500 years and 50 different authors. It's truly, God, we are reading your word. And we love you for it. And we love you for the way that you sent Jesus because you so loved us, you made a way for us to be forgiven and set free from slavery, from the devil who wanted to kill us. And now you've given us life. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Holy God of all creation, you bring life to all who seek your face, yeah. So we lift our hands, our hearts and sweet surrender, and we cry out. your name in all the earth.